Yeah, I mean, you know, it might, might just be the typical midterm bleed or exhaustion, yeah, but. Yesterday there was a, um, a Windows to the World event. Uh, oh, yeah, it was going most of the day, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, right. So, yeah, that, yeah, maybe there were people with that. Um, anywho, well, for those of you who are here, <laughs> Uh, so we have just right, keep, we're, keep working on the assignment right for tonight, and then that's going to form the basis for the draft that we're going to start working on uh, specifically next week. So let me actually start by giving you all the full assignment sheet for paper one. And you know, again, like you know, remember, like before, you know, anyone gets at all frightened by this, remember that much of the groundwork for this you have already done, right? So this paper is going to be a 1,500 word argument based on a close reading of a single text, right? So the close reading you've already been doing of an already chosen text. Um, you're providing an interpretation, but it must be a focused interpretation that relates to a single important theme or idea. And you're using your first, uh, you're using one of your reflection papers and assignment five on page 177 are your starting points. So again, we're gonna be doing this in stages, right? First, sta first stage is gonna be a 1,000 to 1,250 word draft. So you're gonna be adding another 250 to 500 words to what you've already got from assignment five, right? Plus revising it based on whatever feedback I give you. And we'll be working on this in class on Tuesday. So we'll be in the computer lab um, and you will have the opportunity to ask me questions as you're working. Um, okay. So, in terms of what I want you to do for this, Turn to the second page of the assignment here, right? I want you choosing quotes that you think point to some bigger issue or idea in the text and that add up to a pattern, right? And we're, you know, we start with the close reading that you've already been doing, looking for patterns and connections. And I'm also going to want to see you put this into some kind of historical or philosophical context, right? So, does anybody have any questions about this? I mean, like, I think like this is all stuff we've already discussed, and we're going to talk today about developing a thesis. So, is there anything here that is confusing or surprising to you? Okay. Okay, I'll give you a minute to look it over, ask any questions you might come up with. But I think by now we mostly understand what we're doing. So now is this us combining all three of our papers of our curriculum or is this? Nope, you're, you're choosing one as a starting point. So you're using one of your reflection papers, which you're going to develop a little bit in the assignment that's due tonight, right? And you're going to be developing that further for the draft and developing that draft for the final paper, right? So you'll end up at the end of it. So you've started, you started with 500 words, right? Which you'll then revise and build on until you get to 1,500. Right? So there are basically four stages to this assignment, right? The first is the reflection paper, the second is the assignment in the textbook, the third is the draft, and then the fourth is the final paper. And it's still on the call? Uh, that is correct, yes. Um, actually, the, the draft is due on the 12th. The final paper is due on the 19th. Yeah. So the draft will factor in to your midterm grade, the final paper will not. And here's, you know, look, I'm not going to say don't do the best you can on the draft, because the more the better you do on the draft, and the more you do for the draft, the less you'll have to do for the final paper, right? But 
as long as the draft meets the assignment requirements, you will get full credit for it. So I'm not going to be I'm not going to be grading the draft based on quality. I'm going to be grading that based on completion. I will be grading the final paper based on quality, right? So if say like you don't address my feedback on the draft in the final paper, then you're going to get dinged on that, right? And so for the assignment tonight, we should, uh -huh. we should be addressing feedback that we got. Yeah, address the feedback that I gave you on the original reflection paper, revise it, and then add to it. So continue on to the paper we were using for the homework that's due tonight. Yes. So we're doing with this. Exactly, yep. Okay, so do you want us to wait to submit what we're working on now, just add this into it, and then submit it all as one thing? Or do you want us no, to you're, two separate? No, you're going to be submitting it in stages. Okay. Yeah. And there, there's, a, there's a specific folder in Georgia View for each of the stages, right? And are but, each of the stages getting graded on accuracy as well as completion? Or it's only the draft that's getting graded on complete, solely on completion. And part of this is because I got sick of chasing down students who weren't doing drafts on assignments. So it's like, okay, the draft is worth a certain number of points. If you don't do it, you don't get any points. If you half-ass it, you get half the points, right? So yeah, I mean, it was largely a response to um, classes, like sections in which I just had the students not, ta students not taking the drafting process seriously enough. So I'm just trying to reward you for good behavior. What's that? Are you talking about like the process we've been doing already kind of thing? Like the reflection papers themselves is what you're referring to? That students were No, I was talking to? about like the, the draft stage of the, the final paper. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have always included drafts as part of the process, but um, this has seemed to be an effective way of getting students to actually do the draft and to give me enough material, right? to actually give them feedback. Um, so, what was it I wanted to say? Um, do any of you have any further questions about this? And by the way, the other thing too, like I, just, I wanted, the reason I've broken it up this way is to make the whole process less intimidating, right? It's a lot less scary to have to write, say, 1,250 words and you've already got 700. You know, once you've already started, like, you know, staring at that blank piece of paper is the hardest part of writing, right? Once you've got something down, it's easier to find more to say. All right, so anybody have any other questions about this? Okay, great. So let's talk then about thesis statements. So what's a thesis? in the introduction of your paper, right? Yeah, the thesis is the main argument, the main claim that you're advancing through the paper, right? Think of it as like, yeah, your master or controlling claim. So a good thesis must be arguable in three senses of this word, right? First, it must be supported by evidence. All right, we talked a little about this last time. All right, the thesis has to account for the actual evidence that you're looking at. Secondly, it must be arguable in that it must be something with which another reader could disagree. Right, so remember that a claim is essentially an interpretation of evidence, right? And different readers can come to different conclusions about the same sets of evidence 
and both interpretations could be valid, right? So make sure that the claim you are making, the thesis that you write, is something that another observer could potentially disagree with, right? And finally, and this is perhaps the most important element, it must take a position on your topic. You have to be making a claim. Don't try to hedge and don't give me a statement of fact, right? You have to be providing an interpretation of the text that you're reading. So your thesis must, must, must make a claim. So <clears throat> a good thesis is going to do three things, right? First, it's going to connect a single primary claim to your evidence. So it's going to it's going to narrow the scope of your paper, right? It's going to, you know, give you it's going to give you a focus. The second big thing it's going to do is be open enough to lead you to new ideas, right? Instead of locking you into a single pattern. It's also ideally going to give you a kind of logical progression, right? A logical set of next steps. We're going to show you where to go next. So sort of within the wording of your thesis, you're going to have a direction to follow, right? A next place to go. So a thesis should never be static, right? You're going to develop it throughout the body of the paper. It probably helps if you think of the paper as working almost like an experiment, right? And your thesis is working like as being a kind of hypothesis that you want to test. So does everybody know how the scientific method works? Okay, how, how, does, how does that operate? What do you start with? You start with an observation, right? And then what do you use that observation to come up with? A hypothesis, right? It's like, okay, this is what I think is going on, right? And then you design an experiment to test that hypothesis over and over again until you have either, you know, said, okay, I think maybe this is right, or you demonstrate that it's wrong, right? So think of your paper as working more or less the same way. In each paragraph, you are testing your thesis, you are testing your main claim against a piece of evidence, right? And as the paper progresses, your thesis should become more specific and more qualified, right, based on the evidence you're testing it against. Right, so you generate your thesis from evidence, and then you test it against more pieces of evidence, right? So let's start with an example of like how we might generate a thesis. Um, and I'm just going to go with the example I have always gone with. How many of you have seen the movie Titanic? Okay, just about everyone. Right? Uh, this is why I use this example. I personally hate the movie Titanic, but because it is so culturally ubiquitous, 
you know, then it always works, right? So what's Titanic about? Is it really it's about the not ship? Not really about it. It's like yeah. the story that was made up to be within it. Kind of uh -huh. thing. Yeah, the, the ship is really just a kind of backdrop, right? It's a plot device, right? It's just a, it's a setting, right? Okay. At the end of it, they used to show the history. What's that? It's in the end of it, they used to show the history with showing them finding the ship and the different stuff. Yeah, yeah that's actually kind of an interesting thing about the way the, the whole story is framed, right? The whole thing is framed as salvage, right? We're salvaging something, right? We're going, you know, down to the ocean and we're pulling up this old ship. And at the same time, right, they're also salvaging the memories, right? They're recovering the memories of a stories. survivor. Yeah, yeah, creating, you know, creating stories based on these memories, right? So, yeah, so it's about, on a certain level, right, salvage, Recovery and memory. Okay, so if we're looking, you know, just kind of at the framing device, right? The frame story of the movie. Now, what's the main plot of the movie mostly concerned with? A love story. Yeah, it's a love story, right? In that scene. And who are our protagonists? in this love story. Are you talking about the couple? Yeah. Uh, was it Jack? I can't remember the name. Rose, maybe? Yeah, we have these two characters, Jack and Rose, right? So let's think of what the, the, the characters in this recovered love story are like, right? Let's start with Jack. What do, what do we know about Jack? He's very, like, his lower class. Yeah, lower, so, so yeah, he's poor, right? What else do we know about him? Shows his artistic skill. Okay, yeah, he's an artist. What else? I have the best of Okay. <laughs> okay. I mean, I'm trying to think of the ways that he, he often, like, off and that stuff, like he doesn't take much stuff like seriously. Okay, you know, so, you know, maybe, yeah, like, like not, not, um, careless? Yeah, maybe a little carefree, maybe, carefree. maybe, you know, more so than careless, right? Does he have any real social ties or attachments? No. Yeah, he's completely unattached by and large, right? Not entangled in any kind of larger social world. Wasn't it like his parents were dead or something like that, and then mm -hmm. he was kind of just shoved off Re into the world? Re rather conveniently, in terms of plot, right? Yeah, he has no fam no family ties, and apparently no real friends either, right? Um, what happens to him at the end of the movie? Did you say what happens to him at the end of the movie? What happens to him at the end of the movie? The end of the movie? He yeah. dies. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. He freezes to death in the icy waters of the North Atlantic, right? Well, uh, <clears throat> Rose is you know, lying on a actually pretty sizable door, right? That could probably support the weight of two people. <laughs> okay, what do we know about Rose, the girl? She was part of a rich family. Okay, yeah. Poor boy, rich girl, right? I smell a hollow note song coming on. She was engaged to a very rich man. Okay, yeah, she is engaged to, and what is this very rich man like? He's a jerk. Yeah, he's a real piece of shit, right? So she's engaged to a wealthy turd. So she is not unattached socially, right? In fact, who is she traveling with? Her yeah, she's traveling with family, right? Good. Where he was carefree, she's more 
having to go with the flow of what's happening with her group, and she's like very polite and. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, she is socially connected in a way that is also stifling, right? And we've already noted what her fate is at the end of the movie, right? She survives to a very, very old age. Yeah. She was over 100. Mm -hmm. Are they the same age? More I don't actually no. <laughs> now that I think about it, I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't think the movie really makes much out of that. I mean, you would imagine like roughly the same age, right? They're probably both in their late teens or early twenties. So her her mom makes a big deal about the fact that she's starting to act like that, and she needs to act older than mm -hmm. she is, and mm -hmm. she's acting her age. Yeah, well, and you know, let's also you know, remember that in 1912, you know, the year the Titanic launched and sank, um, you know, uh, a girl who was unmarried at 20 was an old maid, right? So, she is probably quite, yeah, they're both quite young, right? All right, so this kind of gives me enough to start with, right? So I'm looking at this love story, and I'm thinking that what interests me here is the cross-class angle, right? We have a poor boy and a rich girl. So how likely is this relationship on the land, right? How, what are the odds that they would actually meet each other, say, like in a normal European city in 19? Pretty slim, right? They would probably not run into one another. So we have them, you know, on this ship together, this kind of contained floating world, right? So my initial idea I have a quick like, question. Yeah. Was the Titanic like bringing them somewhere or was it just a trip like a cruise type? Yeah, it was going to New York. Okay. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, it was it was going from um, it was built in Belfast, picked up passengers I think in London and Paris, stopped in Ireland to pick up more passengers, and then doesn't make it to New York. Right? Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I mean, for yeah, for a lot of people, I mean, a cruise always has a destination, right? There's always some place you're going. Um, and I think for a lot of people, it was just a kind of social prestige pleasure cruise thing, right? It's like, oh, you know, I am, you know, Mr. Wealthy London Merchant Man, and I am going to buy a ticket on this, uh, you know, this fancy new ship. Um, it also, you know, <laughs> teaches us never to call anything invincible or unsinkable, right? Yeah. <laughs> The minute you put that label on something. And then now they yep. have their life goes on. Na nature, like yep, nature is going to test it, yeah. Um, but anyway, like, so the idea that I come up with here, if we're looking at this as a love story, right, with the cross-class angle, is that the ship creates a special contained world in which egalitarian cross-class relationships are possible. And then I start testing other pieces of evidence against this original idea, right? So, yeah, this relationship between Jack and Rose looks pretty egalitarian, and they only meet because they're on a ship together. But, do other class relationships on the ship <coughs> seem to be this egalitarian? What is that? People treated as equals. 
Yeah, for one thing, people like Jack aren't allowed on the parts of the ship that people like Rose hang out on, right? Didn't he get to that because he stole a jacket? Yeah, well, he, I think he, he saves her life, right? He stops her from jumping off the ship, and then her family invites him to dinner. Is that the that's part where she's at the front of the ship? Or is that different? That's, that's different. yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's very yeah. Different. But yeah, so, so he has only actually met her by going someplace that neither of them was supposed to go, right? I thought she went to his part of the ship. They did, yeah, they visit both, right? Well, I'm talking about when she went to jump, I thought he went, she went down to the lower part where his part mm -hmm. of the ship was. Yeah. I, I, I don't remember exactly where she goes to jump off the ship. But anyway, like, they only really need because both of them go to parts of the ship where they're not supposed to be, yes. right? So the ship is actually closed off based on the price of your ticket, right? There are parts that are supposed to be closed to you. And when he goes to the rich part of the ship, you know, to be rewarded with a dinner, you know, for convincing her not to jump by her family, they're real dicks to him, right? Now, when she comes down to his part of the ship, and, you know, they're hanging out with all the Irish immigrants below decks, right? Everybody's nice to her and she's having fun, but it's also clear that she doesn't really fit in there, right? Or, you know, to her really understand what's going, anything that's going on. Are they English? Uh, she is. He is apparently an American. Yes. Who happened to be in Paris for whatever reason. He had traveled, won a ticket to travel there and had to win a ticket back. Yeah, yeah. So, <clears throat> while our initial impression is that the ship creates this kind of egalitarian world, in fact, the ship is just as rigidly divided socially as classes are on land, right? So we can make that kind of the second version of our thesis here. So So while Jack and Rose's relationship appears to be one between equals They only meet by breaking the ship's rules. Now then we might also want to think about how this factors in, right? Who lives and who dies. That <clears throat> Not only does Rose survive, right, but the whole story is essentially told from her perspective, right? Jack's story ends in the water near that iceberg, right? But Rose's continues. And in fact, he sacrifices his life for her, right? We also see numerous other moments in kind of like the final act of the movie where rich people are given opportunities for heroism, right? Whether they're directing rescue efforts or they're gallantly giving up their seats in a lifeboat for women and children, right? While the poor passengers are simply locked down below decks and can't do anything except, you know, put their children to bed and wait for the end, right? So, what the fates of the poor are simply kind of exploited for pathos, right, to make you feel sad. Well, the rich are the only ones really given an opportunity for action. So what does that say to us then, that the film ultimately seems to value this rich girl more than it values the poor boy? If we're examining this in terms of class. I mean, I think that, that that's kind of where, where this is trending, right? It's like, so... They don't really care about the poor people. Poor people are paying, so, I mean, they care mm -hmm. enough, but it's really about the rich people who are paying a whole bunch more, who are more and more uh -huh. to keep happy. Yeah, well, I mean, I think, like, less, less about, like, you know, the ship and more about the film, right, and the way the film treats both of these.
these um, groups, right? So <clears throat> we can sort of come up with a more or less final version of this, right? By saying that the film gestures towards a classless or at least less hierarchical social order, but by valuing the rich characters more than the four characters, ends up simply reinforcing the existing <coughs> social order. So you notice how there are two ideas contained in this final statement, right? One that I'm arguing for, one that I'm trying to promote, right? and one that I'm arguing against, right? one that I'm using for kind of like back pressure. This kind of tension is actually a good thing to put in your thesis, right? Giving yourself something to react against, right? Because it shows that you've weighed alternatives and you've considered other possible answers to the question, right? That you've actually thought about other things that might be going on here, right? So this is what it looks like might be happening on the surface, right? But if I dig a little deeper, this is what I find is really going on. So does anybody have any questions about this process so far? Okay. I do have a question. Yeah, sure. So with our themes with the readings that we choose, Uh huh. What kind of, like, how this one, this one has, like, a theme where you can do it like that, but what kind of themes are you looking for in what we're writing? Like, um, is it just, like... I mean, there's no specific theme or type of theme that I'm looking for. Um, you know, really, like, I mean, whatever you find in it is... So, like, the sword and the law would be a good theme for that reading kind of thing, like, looking at it that way. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? The sword and the law kind of... Theme. Okay, yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the, 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 the sword and the law thing, that could be kind of an entry point for thinking about, like, say, issues of justice in that particular text and how it defines justice, right? Yeah, I mean, that, that, is, that is something you could use. But yeah, I mean, essentially, like, you know, what you're, the, like, the theme that you end up choosing, right, or the idea you end up choosing is going to come from your examination of the evidence. Right. So I chose this cross-class thing looking at this because, of, I, because I noticed something interesting in the way these two characters are set up. Right? It's like, okay, here's something you know, maybe a little unusual here. It's a rich girl and a poor boy. Right? So why don't I see what this is trying to do with issues of class? And then I get to my argument by applying that to the whole, set, the whole setup of the film. Does that make sense? Okay, so what I'd like you to take a few minutes doing now, right, is uh, do you all still have the handout that I gave you last time? I gave you a copy just now. Uh, you know, it's the Generating Claims from Evidence Handout. <clears throat> so I want you to take a few minutes to continue with that, right? And I want you to try to follow this process and see if you can develop a thesis of this kind from it, right? I know that some of you, um, you know, and I, I get that like, some of this is couched like, in the kind of language that English professors use, or I'm not ex expecting that, right? But just something of this kind of form, right? You know, like just have an idea, like notice a theme or a pattern, make a claim about what you think is happening, 
and then test as many of the pieces of evidence against it as you can and see what you can come up with, okay? Are we allowed to use the same ones we wrote the quote and evidence for? Yeah, you can use, yeah, yeah absolutely. So yeah, just uh, work on that for a few minutes. I'll be right back. Yeah, and just to be clear, you know, it is absolutely okay to build on the work that we did last time, right? So you can fall back on the patterns we identified last time, the, uh, you know, some of the claims you came up with last time. But remember that you're trying to ultimately come up with a claim that accounts for as much of the evidence as possible, right? Without being too wishy-washy.
what do you mean? Like you're saying that these sites are supposed to be able to, is supposed to have the ability to be argued. A lot of these yeah. are just like factual things that are kind of difficult to argue. Well, with right, because, because these aren't claims, right? This is evidence you're supposed to be using to generate claims, right? Oh, okay. Well, I, I did that. How many of you feel like you could use a little more time with this? How many did you want to use? Um, I want you to try to come up with a claim, like one master claim that accounts for as much of the evidence as possible. That's what we're looking for. So these two points. Pardon? I said the two that I have relate. Like they go off of each other. Okay. Take the general science to see what people would like a little more time. Okay. Right, take another four or five minutes.
take two more minutes with this. Okay, so who is willing to share what they've come up with and how they got there? Okay, I have the rise of sodas and the car. Okay. It's lit. Oh, do you want to Okay, the rise of suburbs and the car has led to um, rigid district building and the specialization. personal cars. Okay. All right. And how did you get there? Well, I started out with just the district building. Okay. And then I thought that rigid district building relates to suburbs and also to how we build around cars. Okay. And I added that and, try, and I tried to use so this to prove that in my mind. Okay. So which pieces of the I guess what I'm asking is like which pieces of the evidence fit together for you to contribute to this? Uh, you want me to list them? Uh, yeah, go ahead. I said uh, older American towns and cities are sort of put in grid patterns mm -hmm. in which multiple walking and driving routes can be used to reach the same destination in the same amount of time. Newer cities and suburbs tend to be designed as cul-de-sacs that empty out onto a single feeder road. Okay. I used um, American homes built before 1950 really had attached garages and carports. Mm -hmm. American neighborhoods developed after 1950 rarely have sidewalks. Okay. The implications of that being that you don't have sidewalks because everyone drives, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Um, from the 60s to the 90s, retail and commercial development moved from traditional centralized downtowns to highway strips, industrial parks, and enclosed shopping malls. Okay. Um, suburban neighborhoods rarely offer public transportation. Mm -hmm. Urban neighborhoods and traditional downtowns usually include a mix of commercial government and residential real estate, while in the suburb neighborhoods, different land uses are strictly separated by zoning laws. Okay, yeah, and there's the specialization, right? Yeah. And then the last one. Yeah. That like the people who live in those neighborhoods often want to keep everything just far apart, right? Okay, good. All right. Anybody else willing to share what they came up with? Nope, because I didn't do it right. Like I struggle with this and that makes a lot of sense looking well, at it that way. You know, I mean and I mean look like thesis development is hard, right? 
And I know that the way that I'm asking you to do it is probably not the way a lot of you are used to doing it. Yeah, yeah, and I'm asking you to come up with, some, I'm giving you a set of information, right, and asking you to come up with your own interpretation of it. So yeah, and you know, that's, that's hard, right? And you know, that's here, especially if it's something you don't feel like you know very much about. Um, so I totally understand that this is difficult and a little intimidating for some of you, right? But if we can work through that initial fear and intimidation, you're going to end up writing much better papers, right? Not just for this class, but for any class that you're in, much more original papers, right? Because this is stuff that's going to come from your own um, <clears throat> interpretation of data and not from, you know, a, you know, a question your instructor specifically asked you. So um, I'm going to give you an example of how you might develop a thesis from this as well and sort of point to where I got it from. And I think we sort of gestured towards some of this at the end of last class, or this might have been my Monday Wednesday section, I don't really remember because the two of you blur in my mind. Um, so. Well, most American neighborhoods are designed around cars the way we spend our leisure time our aversion to new construction suggests that we don't like cars as much as we think we do. Line, second word, or third line, second word. Aversion. Okay. So let me show you what I started with here to get this right. So I started with the one piece of evidence that doesn't seem to fit with any of the others easily, right? At several of America's most popular tourist destinations, including the parks at Disney World, the Atlantic City Boardwalk, cars are not permitted, right? So at the kinds of places where we like to vacation, right? You walk around the park, you walk around the area, you don't drive, right? You might, you know, park at some kind of central location, and then you spend the rest of the day on foot away from your car. And I'm connecting that to this last piece of information about people in suburban neighborhoods opposing the building of new housing units, schools, hospitals, or retail centers near their homes. Now, why do people usually not want these things built near their homes? Traffic and noise. Exactly. They don't want the traffic, right? And we can look at this in connection with the bit about older American towns and cities as well, right? The fact that you know traditional development patterns allow for walking and driving in multiple patterns, so you don't you don't get traffic jams because if you know there's a snarl someplace, you can go another way. Whereas the cul-de-sac development is really only designed to spit everybody out on the feeder road that goes to the highway. So it's designed in a way that creates snarls, right? So. You know, there are other, you know, not to belabor this too much because there's really one more thing I want to get on to today, right? But you can use these related facts, right, to make the claim that <clears throat> our relationship with cars is one in which we're stuck, right, rather than one that we've chosen. And in fact, when we make our own choices, we often choose not to drive. 
Okay. Uh, so, anybody have any questions about this? And you know, when you're doing this at home for your own paper, too, you won't be doing it, you know, with 15 minutes arbitrarily set up, set up by the instructor, right? You, know, you can take your time with it, um, and <clears throat> you know, really try to pour over and think about the information. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about today is how we can recognize and fix uh, weak thesis statements, right? So if you find yourself writing something that looks sort of like this, I want you to be able to identify it and to come up with a solution, right? So I'm going to write a thesis statement on the board, and you are going to tell me what is wrong with it, okay? So first example. Despite many ups and downs, the movement for women's suffrage in the United States was successful. What's wrong with this? Okay. Yeah, exactly. The problem with this is, is there's nothing to argue here, right? It's a historical fact. You know, what was the purpose of the women's suffrage movement? To get women the right to vote. Do women now have the right to vote? Yes, right? So yeah, this is a statement of fact. So what you would want to do to make something like this into an arguable thesis is interrogate the facts, right? Find something specific within the facts to question or to think about, right? So one thing you might notice as you look a little bit more deeply into the history of the women's suffrage movement, right, is that there was um, a pretty serious racial divide within that movement. Um, and that many of the benefits initially accrued only to middle class or upper class white women, right? So <clears throat> you could use that particular complicating factor to come up with a more arguable thesis, right? Something like While women's suffrage immediately benefited middle class white women, Those benefits were gained at the expense of black and working class women. So what you can do is question something about the historical fact, right? Question the historical narrative in some way. Question the fact itself, right? And find something arguable within it. That's how you would fix that. Okay. Second example. In this paper, I will examine whether Hamlet is genuinely insane
or is just pretending to be? What's the problem with this? It's just telling you what they're going to do. Yeah, there's no claim being made here, right? The, uh, the author is not taking any kind of position on this. It's like, okay, here are the two alternatives. I'm not going to tell you which one I am going to choose, right? Yeah, so there's no claim here. So the fix for this would actually be pretty simple, right? Particularly for this example, you know, decide on what you think is which of these you think is going on and why, right? Pick a position. Third example, and this relates back to what we were doing at the beginning of class. In Titanic, Jack sacrifices his life to save Rose. Proving that true love conquers all. Now, there's an easy way to spot what's going on here, right? Do you see any kind of phrase in this that looks kind of conventional or formulaic? True love conquers all. Yeah. This is a cliche, right? So cliches, well, let me ask you this. What is, what is a cliche? What do you think a cliche is? What do you think this word means? Something that like everybody knows or like is associated with a certain. Yeah, it's just like this commonly held idea, right, that we sometimes plug in as a substitute for doing any real thought, right? So love conquers all being one of these ideas, right? It's like, I don't actually have an idea about Titanic, so I'm just going to rely on this kind of conventional wisdom, right? So you would deal with this the same way you deal with the statement of fact, right? Question the conventional wisdom in some way, right? What's weird or problematic about what you're noticing here, right? So, <laughs> You might reverse this even by thinking about what Rose's unwillingness to sacrifice her life for Jack means, right? In Titanic, Rose's unwillingness to share that enormous door with Jack comments on, I don't know, like, just spit on it, the tendency of the rich to hoard resources. <laughs> but that's good, she didn't. What's that? She didn't not unwillingly share, they tried like four times. I know. I'm just I'm just trying to come up with an with an example of like how you might question the cliche. Oh, okay. Yeah, you're saying. yeah. I'm not trying to make a specific legitimate argument about the movie here. <laughs> I was really confused. I'm like, that's against the better <laughs> It's also you know it's also frankly it's been a long time since I've actually like I said I, I actually hate that movie so I haven't Honestly, so, so I haven't watched it. I just know so much about because yeah. it's one of my mom's favorites. Okay, two more examples I want to give you, and then I'll let y'all go. And I do want to talk briefly next time before we start uh, talking about, before we start working your graphs, a little bit about introductions and conclusions. But we'll save that for next time. All right, example number four. Although, you know, if Jack is the one telling her not to share the door, then that's even, that's even darker, right? Because then the poor are complicit in the rich hoarding their stuff, right? True. Okay. Fourth example.
Marijuana should be legalized everywhere. Since making it illegal violates my right What's problematic about this as a thesis? What is the argument based on? My rights. And like rebellion? Rights. My rights. My rights. Okay, the my should be a giveaway here, what the problem is, right? What is this person trying to argue from? Are they trying to argue from evidence? Yeah, they're, tr they're solely trying to argue from personal conviction, right? So this goes back to what we said even at the beginning of the semester about naturalizing our own assumptions, right? You know, assuming that the way we see the world is the way everyone sees the world and the way everyone ought to see the world, right? This is one of the reasons why you want to make sure you root your arguments in actual, concrete, specific evidence. So you could certainly make the argument that marijuana should be legalized, right? But what you would need to do is weigh evidence, right? You would need to look at, okay, like, you know, what's happened? This is David Bowie telling me to wrap up. Um, what's happened in states where marijuana has been legalized? You know, has there been any change in, you know, crime rates? Or has there been any change in, um, you know, <clears throat> rates of, you know, particular diseases, right? You know, and are there other factors? We, we could actually trace this back to what we were talking about last time with the gun, that gun rights argument, right? The student in that case was arguing from personal conviction rather than from evidence. And then one last one. I'm just going to, because we're out of time, I'm just going to tell you what's wrong with this one, right? The overly broad generalization. If I were to say, for example, something like the French Revolution set people free from tyranny. Right. That's really vague and really broad, right? I'm not talking at all about the specific circumstances that led to the revolution. I'm not talking about um, you know, the progress of the revolution at all. I'm not kind of dealing with any of the difficult factors that occurred within the revolution. So again, like make sure that before you write out a thesis, you have fully interrogated and defined any of the terms within it. So, for example, to make this kind of argument, what I would really need to do is make an argument about what tyranny is and how the French Revolution defeated it, right, or did something about it. Okay, so does anybody have any questions? All right, so remember, next time we are meeting not here but in the computer lab, right? And we are going to be working on drafts. So bring whatever you have of paper one to work on.